Welcome everyone to the Be Memorable for Miles podcast, the only podcast for advisors in Atlantic Canada. I'm your host Hudson Miles. I'm the Director of Sales for Atlantic Canada for BMO Global Asset Management. And today I'm very happy to welcome my guest, James Pollard, who is the founder of Advisor Coach. James works with advisors throughout North America on helping them to find ways to change the effectiveness of their marketing. Uh, I followed James on LinkedIn for quite a while, and I, I think he brings a lot of great insights and, and ideas. And and uh, if you if you work with him or follow follow his his ideas, I think you'll find great success. So, James, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. I, I am so glad to be here. And it's funny that you mentioned you've been following me for a while. Um, so you communicated with my assistant like the first two times. It, it's my email address. It's all the same thing. But right. when I went to find you, I typed your name in and I had emails or, and stuff from like 2017. I was like, wow, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, this is kind of cool. But no, this is awesome. I'm this, I'm glad to see you doing this. You're helping a lot of people. Yeah, well, I'm trying to, trying to be a little different. Uh, I don't really like to just sell product as the only value that I bring to the table. And I think that's the same for most advisors. I think you've got to bring more than just offering product. Uh, product has become a commodity in this business and there's definitely no shortage of it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's just jump right into it. And why don't we just start by maybe you could tell me a little bit about yourself and your background and and, and just overall your sort of your, your business. So if people don't know the advisor coach, I mean, we were talking before the call about how the name, the name may or may not be the best name now. Uh, so I did start off um, basically it's as if financial services and marketing had a child and it was me. Uh, I primarily come from market, different marketing functions uh, within financial services. Although I have, I've done everything from launch print on demand stores. I've, I've run the marketing department of multi tens of million dollars of casino department. Uh, if people listen to my podcast, I've told stories about that as well. And I did start off because financial advisors, who I mean, I had some friends who are financial advisors and they asked me about marketing and I gave them some ideas and they implemented them and they're like, hey, this is really cool. They started referring me out. Can you do instead of Bill, can you do this for John? Can you do this for Joe? Can you do this? Like, well, maybe I've got something here. And that was back in 2014-ish, uh, late 2014. And I said, well, maybe I could take this show on the road <laughs> and start. I did cold outreach. I mean, that's the thing. A lot of people claim to be good marketers and have good marketing processes, but they don't market their business well. And right. some, it's just goofy. So I took my own marketing skills, marketed myself, marketed my business. I'm primarily a marketer and did the coaching. Uh, today, we have transitioned mainly into an information products business. I, I make no bones about that. That's what it is. Uh, a lot of advisors can get more value from something that's packaged. It's a prepackaged solution. They can keep it. They can reference it. They can use it again and again. Um, and then today, the bulk of my business is through a monthly paper and ink newsletter called the James Pollard Inner Circle. It, it just follows the same philosophy of here you go. It, you can get the same coaching for a uh, lower price. It reaches more people and you can keep it essentially. No, that's great. Um, so, but getting right into what you do and, and uh, sort of some of the things you work with advisors, I know that you've said to me in the past that you prefer LinkedIn over other social media networks for, for financial advisors. And why, why do you feel that way? LinkedIn, without a doubt, is the most powerful social media platform for financial advisors. There are several reasons. The first one is scale. And when people get into my world and they start doing things my way, two of the things that I preach are leverage which right. is the ability to take like one piece of content and use it again and again and again. For example, this podcast is it's leverage. You and I are recording. You're probably going to use it again and again and again. It, it could be six months from now. Someone will listen to it. Someone will benefit from it. That's leverage. Uh, if you can get into a position where you're constantly leveraging your time, leveraging your resources and leveraging your assets, you really have no choice but to grow. It, it just doesn't happen any other way. In LinkedIn's case, that could be publishing an article, that could be sharing a status update, that could be 
uh, hiring a virtual assistant to message people on LinkedIn to keep in touch with them. It, you're leveraging your time this way. Also, scale. On LinkedIn, you can reach 100 people just as easily as you can reach 1,000. It depends on how big your network is. It depends on how well you know the algorithm. I'm not going to get techie into this because it you really don't need to be that tech savvy in order to benefit from any of the stuff I do. It's just that if given the choice, I would rather reach a thousand people at a time than a hundred. And if you put your time in on LinkedIn and you grow your network and you build relationships and you connect with people, especially if you have a niche, that's when it gets really powerful. If you're if you're a financial advisor and you work specifically with physicians and you have a network, a, a large network on LinkedIn of physicians only, you're working with a powerful, powerful tool. And it beats the pants off of cold calling uh, of certain seminar marketing. I mean, webinars have scale, but like in-person seminars, it just can't be touched. And it's so easy for financial advisors to A, create a LinkedIn account, and B, start networking with people that there's really no excuse not to do it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I LinkedIn is one of the is the only platform, quite frankly, that I talk to advisors about using for their business. And it's all for all the reasons that you just mentioned. I also find that it's it's there's a lot less uh, noise on LinkedIn compared to other networks, social networks or or whatever. It's you know, there's not a lot of, of active. I, I can say in my at least in my part of the country where I take care of advisors. There's not a lot of advisors that are using LinkedIn effectively, so your competition is not, it's not a vast uh, amount of competition. So from that perspective, I think it makes a lot of sense. So, um, and so now with with advisors going virtual, how do you think that that impacts LinkedIn? Does it make it more or less effective? It, it makes it more effective, and that's just one of many different tools in your toolbox that you can use to make LinkedIn more effective. Back to the niche thing, I was writing about it this morning. We have on LinkedIn, we have financial advisors who are generalist. This is like the top, it's like an inverted pyramid and they're at the top. Then you have people who choose a niche and that can be fine and that works well. But imagine if you niche down even further for let's just say geographic area like you're doing. If you have a financial advisor who's in Toronto and that financial advisor works specifically with physicians, LinkedIn allows you to not only find physicians, but allows you to filter by geography. So right. you are hyper relevant. You're not just a generalist financial advisor online and you're not just a financial advisor targeting physicians. You can take it a step further. And if you're going virtual, you can let it be known. This is a competitive advantage. There are so many advisors who reached out to me in March where the world was going to an end uh, yeah. and they were freaking out. And I, I do feel bad for them at some level, but they should have been preparing this whole time. That's a, that's a story for another show. But when it comes to going virtual, it's not a disadvantage. You're like, oh no, I have to go virtual. I have to work virtual now. Well, would you rather live in a world where that didn't exist, where you didn't have the capability to talk with someone like I'm talking with you now, where, where you can find people and you can network with them easier than ever before. And if you're a financial advisor who happens to have account minimums, or if you prefer to work with high net worth or ultra high net worth investors, these people prefer virtual. They prefer to find the best and go after the best and they will come to you. Sure. There's a place, there's a time and a place for outbound marketing. And I, I help advisors with outbound marketing, but the, the raw reality is the, the highest caliber investors they don't really respond to outbound as well as everyone else so if for example i have never met my accountant in person ever uh, well i have two now i've never met them in person i've never met my attorneys in person i've never met my insurance agents in person i've never met my own personal financial advisor in person ever and i've hired i've got people on my team that i've never met they've been working for me <laughs> for quite some time i've never met them in person. I mean, we have meetings like this all the time, but I just, I've never met him in person because I would rather have access to a talent pool that's nationwide or rather than just in my geographic area. I mean, I know that that can be used, but I, I want the best. And 
if you're a financial advisor who wants clients who seek out nothing but the best and create that sort of ecosystem, LinkedIn is your best friend, especially if you're going virtual. Yeah, and it's a, it's especially uh, relevant in in this part of the country. Uh, Atlanta, Canada, as you may, you may not know, but Atlanta, Canada makes up is made up of the four easternmost provinces in Canada. So it's New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland. And what we see happening here is there's an outbound migration of younger people, and many of the best and brightest leave here and. And advisors are, are dealing with their parents, um, and they have for a couple of decades. But you know, um, Tom, their son, who's now an engineer and he's working in Western Canada, well, he's got interest in moving back to Halifax because his opportunity is is elsewhere. And we're seeing people that are leaving leaving the country even um, to go find employment. And so, yeah, I mean, virtual is the only way that you're going to protect your assets. I mean, forget about growing, which obviously is a, is a great option, but th this is protecting against shrinking because, and if you're not using virtual, then, then somebody else is, or, or somebody local is going to take the assets that you're controlling here in Nova Scotia and they're going, they're going outbound. Yeah. So the, the insurance agent that, or one of the insurance agents I work with and my accountant are both in New York. Um, it's not, I never saw out New York accountant or insurance agent or anything like that. It's just, a, they had a, they served a very specific need that I had and they were the best at doing it. So I chose them. They on two separate occasions said the exact same thing that New Yorkers are leaving New York because of the high tax rate and because of all uh, other factors. I don't know. I've never lived in New York, but uh, you tell me that that's what's happening. And you're completely a hundred percent right. The only way they could possibly keep these people as clients is to go virtual, is to have these meetings, is to stay in touch, is to keep the relationship. Because if you didn't have this and the internet and even just something as simple as a phone call, but it, it doesn't work as effectively as like a Zoom meeting. But if you didn't have that, they would be looking for people in Delaware or Maryland or Florida or wherever they're moving. Even my own, my own mother and father-in-law, they have kept their relationship with their financial advisors who one is in New Jersey and one is in Delaware, they've kept the relationship solely because it's virtual and they've been gone for years and they haven't, they haven't met with them in person that I know of in years. Well, and I think the other thing too, and, and you know, we could talk about this for a long time, but I want to cover a couple of other uh, subjects too, but, but the, uh, the other part of it is I know in, in certain parts of, of where we are here, there's the whole idea of, of privacy and, and confidentiality and, and the smaller the community is that you live in, the more worried you are and the more yeah. likely there is going to be a breach of confidentiality. And so yeah. dealing with somebody virtual is, is way more effective. Too. There's always a, there's, there's always a segment of the population, uh, no matter what their net worth is, no matter what their income is, they just want it to be private and you want to respect their wishes. Of course, always put the, put the client first, always, but uh, it, that doesn't, soothe their fears as well if it, they stay in that small town and every, you're right a couple of people will talk and they'll be like hey did you i didn't know joe had this much money and even though they're okay. not supposed to do that but the word gets out yeah for sure um so let's just shift gears here and and uh, talk about email and i i'd have to tell you that i don't hear a lot of advisors in my territory who are effectively using email to to market or to to grow, so maybe you could tell me why why you found that email is a very powerful tool for for financial advisors. So full disclaimer, I, I don't believe that any financial advisor should ever de depend on any one of these tools. Like, don't depend on LinkedIn, don't depend on seminars, don't depend on email. These are all just parts of your marketing machine that should be working at all times. Email is just another way to follow up with prospective clients. It is another way to build the relationship because financial services, it's intangible. There's a book that was written back in the 90s called Selling the Invisible. It was about financial mm -hmm. services and how you can't feel, touch, see it. You can't experience it until you buy it, kind of right. like a chiropractic service or a medical treatment. You can't, ex you can't experience it until it's done, essentially. And 
people look for anything they can to justify the decision to work with you. And this is coming from like marketing and psychology. Right. It, the reason that email works really, really well is because you are continually staying in front of someone. You are continually sharing stories. You are continually pr providing information to them. Now that builds the relationship. And my approach to email is a bit unorthodox compared to stock market commentary newsletters, which are the absolute worst. And <laughs> they are, it's, they just don't work as well. My approach I, is, <clears throat> my approach is, is just plain text, a story, it could be about you. It could be about how you help a certain niche. And mm -hmm. at the end, you you can put a call to action. And some firms won't let you do it because it's they think of it as solicitation. Others don't. And they people will work with you or they will reach out to you. It, it's just another way to keep in touch. It's just another way to follow up. That's all it is. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you as far as the, the whole idea of emailing people about the stock market. I, I think the same thing about LinkedIn. I think that it's the, the best way or the fastest way to get somebody to tune out of, of your LinkedIn posts is to continually post things that they have absolutely no interest in and that are not really in their, you know, in their sphere of, of, uh, of even understanding, let alone interest. Um, so do you have some, some recommendations on how there's, how you help advisors or how, how advisors are making email more effective? So you you just mentioned where you want to talk about things that are interesting to your target market. One of the people that I've learned, I've never gotten a chance to meet him because he passed away before I could. One of the people that I've learned a lot from is a gentleman who is called the world's most feared negotiator. And his name is Jim Camp. And he, the FBI would call him for his negotiation teachings and his lessons. And he legitimately the best negotiator in the world. And a lot of the people in 2019 and 2020, negotiation is hot. Like it's a buzzword and people are studying different negotiators or whatever. But this guy is, is the original. One of the things that he said was that you are always safe in the other person's world. And he said that in a negotiation context, meaning talk about them, if they're asking for hostages or whatever, <laughs> ask why they want <laughs> hostages, and but stay in their world. That's marketing 101. And the the way you make email effective is to stay in your prospective client's world. Niching makes this, I keep going back to niche marketing and virtually everything I do because it makes it easier. If you're sure. a financial advisor who works with small business owners, you have an, uh, an opt-in or a lead magnet where people enter their information for something about small business owners. Then your emails after the fact are about small business owners. You share stories that are relevant to them. You tell a story about how they're the outsiders because not everyone starts a business. They tend to get a job or something like that. You relate to them better than other people can. You can say, as a financial advisor, I run my own business too. I have to deal with bean counters and attorneys and uh, uh, people, angry customers and people who don't want to listen. You can relate to them through email they're never going to respond in the way that they that they do with email with something else simply because those stories cannot be shared in in many other mediums you cannot enter the person's world so if you can't enter their world you won't be safe in the world because you're not there and it, it won't work as well so that's by far the most effective and that's not a tactic or anything that's just a high level strategy never exit their world always talk about stuff that's interesting to them always talk about stuff that's related to them. Yeah, no, that's great advice. <clears throat> and the, um, <clears throat> I guess the final question that I have and, and happy to have you add anything after the fact, but um, so how do you, how do you suggest or recommend financial advisors build an email list? You build an email list uh, with something that's called a lead magnet or opt-in. And I, I just mentioned it. it. It is essentially I mean, you've seen them all over the internet if you've been online for 20 minutes, it seems like, where you offer something in exchange for a, an email address. A webinar right. is a good example of this. When people register for a webinar, they enter their email address. A PDF guide is something that works extremely well. And I, I practice what I preach. My number one lead magnet for the past uh, three years has been 
something called 57 marketing tips for financial advisors and it's at the bottom of every single blog post it is a, a standalone page for advertising if you're a financial advisor and you you create an opt-in you can if you're allowed to advertise online which some people are some people aren't you can send traffic to it you can share it on your social media that hey physicians if you're interested in this or if you're interested in learning more about a certain topic enter your email address here sign up for the email list um, and speaking of physicians, about email content, about four weeks ago, there was a news story that came out about how, I think it was in Hawaii, there were fishermen in Hawaii who caught a 220-pound tuna, and they wow. donated, I know, it's insane, they donated it to uh, healthcare workers in the area. And there's a financial advisor who's in the inner circle who specializes in working with healthcare workers. And he took this news story, and he put it in his email which was for healthcare workers, and he sent it to them. And he talked, it's no money, no finance, no investment strategy, nothing. It's just a story. Thought you'd find this interesting. This is so crazy. I couldn't believe it. And he gets in, he gets responses back like, wow, 220 pound tuna, that's huge. And they freak out. But back to, back to building an email list. Even with LinkedIn, the, there are uh, groups on LinkedIn where if you just, Go to LinkedIn and type in the search bar, physicians. I'm sure there are physicians groups or engineers groups, executives groups. You can share the opt-in there. You're not necessarily soliciting them or uh, just you're, you're offering something that they could be interested in. And there are groups with literally tens of thousands of members. You could share that there. There are so many different ways. Um, I, I would tell advisors, this, is, this surprises a lot of people. And it's one of the three things that really blows people's minds is you don't need a huge email list, especially if you, you, you're in the other person's world. That's why I say you're, you're safe in the other person's world because your conversion rates are going to be higher. Uh, I could compare this to something like cold calling, where if you call a hundred people, let's just say three, say yes to an appointment. Well, if you have an email list, with 100 physicians who have all opted in for your physician-specific lead magnet, so they know you're serious, they know you're in that market, they know what you're getting into, they know you're a financial advisor who serves physicians, you send out emails related to them, building trust, building rapport, building credibility. And when you ask for an appointment, it's not unheard of to get more than three. The, the, the numbers are in your favor. It, it, I don't like to give any generaliza generalizations because it really is different for everyone. But in my marketing personally, I use the benchmark of like 5%. Meaning if you've got 100, you have five appointments, and then you just grow your email list from there. And it's not that hard to build a big business to with email. It just takes, it takes a long time. If, if you're going slowly, it does take some time, but it doesn't, it, I mean, it takes time to build your list. It doesn't take time to do the actual email and send the email, but it does take time to build the list. But the time's going to pass anyway. And I'm not saying to go all in on marketing or email marketing because you're going to do the other stuff. You're going to do social media. You're going to have meetings. You're going to have appointments. You're going to do client service. But your email marketing machine is going to work in the background for you. I don't want to live in any world, any other world besides that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I, I work with a coach and he, a lot of what you just talked, but he would call it a non-sales touch. So it's, it's, you're reaching out to somebody offering them something that you think, or you know, that they will be interested in. Uh, he always talks about stuff that's related to their, uh, their alma mater or something, something like that, where, you know, that, you know, you know University of Washington just is going to the Rose Bowl or whatever it is. Hey, I saw this and then you went there and thought you might think this is a cool article or whatever it might be, but um yeah is that, John that's, Nemo? that sounds like a john nemo thing yeah no it's not john Nemo. no it's uh, okay it's, it sounds uh, just like him I, I did something with him with linkedin and he he says the same thing i was like hmm interesting yeah i know no my, my coach is brian margolis he'd, he'd appreciate uh productivity giant is his uh, group not to plug others but <clears throat> but no that's uh that's great james Any, anything else that uh you think that we i didn't ask you about that you think might be uh helpful to uh to sort of close off with? Yes. Uh, if you're a financial advisor and 
you haven't really been exposed to my business philosophy or my way of doing things. The number one core component, your your north star, your guiding post is multiple marketing strategies. There's nothing more effective. There is nothing more powerful when building a financial services business than multiple marketing strategies. Even if like, I mean, I, I don't know if there have been any statistics updated solely for financial advisors and follow up because I mean, I've, I've tried to put something together and I may have something coming in like 2021 or 2022. But if you just Google follow up statistics or sales statistics, it, it'll say something like the majority of people don't follow up more than twice. And the majority of sales are made after the fifth contact. Right. Well, <clears throat> the, people don't understand or financial advisors don't really understand that people respond to different mediums and they respond to different messages. It, it's really annoying. Yeah, I get it all the time for someone to send a LinkedIn message and send another one and send another one and another, like, yes, they're following up, but they're using the same strategy and they're typically right. just copying and pasting the message. It's just like, get out of here. But if you've got someone who, let's say you call someone and they don't answer and you leave a voicemail, then you follow up with an email. If you've got the email, like, Hey, just called you, wanted to talk about X, Y, Z. You connect with that person on social media. Now this doesn't all have to be within 15 minutes, but you get the idea. You send a handwritten note, maybe a couple months later, uh, you follow up with a message on LinkedIn about an article that you found or your opt-in for your email list uh, or a webinar, and they opt into your email list. And if you have an autoresponder sequence, which you can set up, um, I did an interview with Samantha Russell on the Financial Advisor Marketing Podcast. She's awesome. And she has Lead Pilot. That's like a content marketing and email marketing system. If you set up it an email se sequence to go out automatically, you can have your five follow-up touches right there. And that just blows everything else away. But don't limit it to just email because not everyone responds to the same medium and not everyone responds to the same message. So when you vary that, people will work with you more often than not. It, that's the one thing that I, I wish, like if, if people are in an elevator with me and they're like, what is the one thing I could do to radically transform my business? multiple marketing strategies by far. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Um, so where, uh, if, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, where would they find you? I know they, they can find you on LinkedIn for sure. Cause I, uh, I see it all the time. So LinkedIn is a good one. If you just go to LinkedIn and search James Pollard financial advisor, I guess I will pop up or I hope I do. Otherwise I'm not doing my job. Um, the advisor coach.com is the company website. And the homepage will lead you to the blog and the podcast and the newsletter, if you're interested in that sort of thing. And then uh, some other places. And if you, you get down that rabbit hole, you can get on the email list if you want to. There's just so many resources. I mean, yesterday I submitted uh, the transcript for episode 100 of my podcast, which is coming out wow. in January. I know. It, so 100 episodes, which is really cool. And then I think like close to 100 blogs. I mean, all the articles, I mean, it's all free. It's there. It's there for you to use. Uh, you can decide to do business with me if you want to or if you don't want to, but still, like, I have a, I have a huge content library that people can access. Yeah, absolutely. I've certainly accessed some of it myself, uh, and I, I think it's outstanding. Also, Samantha Russell, I've just started following her recently. Um, I think that's that's one of the things that advisors many of them overlook um, and I, I try to tell them because uh, again, I'm not trying to coach them. I'm trying to just point them in the right directions for the people who I think can help. And there's so much information. There's so much good information and, there, and there's a, there's a ton of free information out there too. And uh, now I do think that you should still, if you want to get serious about this stuff, it, it, <clears throat> it helps to actually hire somebody at least for a period of time and work with them until you're comfortable with, uh, with, with what they're, what they're coaching or talking about. But, but with that, uh, James, I, I really do appreciate you taking 30 minutes or so of your time to, uh, to have a chat. Um, perhaps we can do this again sometime uh, with a, a slightly different uh, twist to it. Uh, maybe in advance of your 100th, uh, the, the airing of your 100th podcast. But um, yeah, once again, thanks very much. And I guess uh, in closing, you know, for those of you that are doing, that are watching this uh, podcast who, uh, who are doing business with us, I really appreciate that and, and hope you uh, continue to do so and I hope you find these podcasts of value. 
And for those of you who are, are watching this and don't presently do business with me, uh, I'd love to take the chance or to have a chance to, to have it sit down. I guess we're, we're allowed to start doing that again, sitting down with people. It's not all virtual. Mm -hmm. but either sit down with people or or have a phone call or, or whatever, just to talk about how how what I'm trying to do is 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 bringing more value than just selling product. And if you're following me on LinkedIn or watching my podcast, and I think you you get that idea. So um, with that, I'm just going to sign off and say, you know, remember to be memorable and you hit it for miles. And with that, James, thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day and hope to talk to you soon. Thank you.